The Bob Murphy Show, episode 296. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Bob Murphy Show. Today we're going to be speaking with Jacob Winograd, who many of you probably know under the handle of Biblical Anarchy on Twitter. I refuse to call it X, by the way. It's not going to happen. Unless Elon says that the payments he makes to me are contingent upon that, in which case X marks the spot. Anyway, Jacob, let me just read a little bit from his official bio. Jacob Winograd created the Biblical Anarchy podcast as a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. In it, he attempts to make the case for a free society and decentralized governance based on biblical principles of limited authority. He also asks what it truly means to render unto God what is God's and what the implications for Christians are in light of Christ being king and Christians being called to serve only his kingdom. In addition, Jacob is also involved in various positions with the Mises Caucus, Christian Caucus, and Libertarian Party in his state. And so, as you may not be surprised to hear, Jacob and I talk about his bread and butter issues, namely render unto Caesar. You know, what, what does Jesus mean by that? Is he saying, oh, you just got to pay your taxes? Well, maybe, maybe not. And, of course, the famous Romans 13 passage. But he, Jacob does give a different take than most of the people who have discussed that on this show. So I will say that. So, without further ado, here is my discussion with Jacob. Jacob, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. Hey, Bob, thanks for having me on. Uh, really appreciate it. Long time listener and fan. Oh, I, I appreciate that. And I've certainly seen you. You you, you are active on Twitter, right? Yeah, I've fair, been fairly active on Twitter for a few years now. What's your handle there? Uh, at Biblical Anarchy. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. But I didn't want to say that and then it looks silly. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I thought that was you. Uh, well, why don't we start? I, I will have given some of the your bio in the intro, but just for people to hear it in your words, can you explain how is it that you're, you know, immersed in both biblical Christianity, but also, I don't know if you call yourself a libertarian or an ANCAP or what, just can you give us a little background just so people know where yeah. you're coming from? Sure. So I guess like the quick summary would be a group of pastors kid uh, sort of did a rebellion against the more conservative Republican upbringing I had. I was uh, still a Christian, but I was like a progressive Christian on the left. I was a registered Democrat. Like I got big into Bernie Sanders when he uh, became popular back in like 2015, 2016. And then after 2016, when Trump was elected, the way the left reacted to that sort of broke my worldview. Uh, about two years later, I, after kind of going through a political sojourn, discovered libertarianism and discovered the the Austrian school. So I discovered the Mises Institute through Dave Smith. And so I found Tom Woods. I found you, uh, found others like that, and then uh, quickly became a, you know, more Austrian libertarian and then a uh, ANCAP shortly after that. When uh, COVID hit in 2020 and I saw so many churches locking down, I just felt that that was wrong. Uh, I mean, maybe at the beginning when it was like, okay, we don't know what we're dealing with, I sort of understood it. But when there were churches still locked down in August, I, I was upset by that. And then also upset by different churches who decided not to lock down, being shut down by their governments. And I felt like, you know, there's a strong correlation between libertarianism and Christianity. And I wanted to try to, you know, make that case uh, the best I could. So that's when I started uh, getting into the podcasting sphere, uh, which was it also a learning experience. And I started to develop my views more. And that's kind of how I came to where I am today. About a year ago, I joined 
the Libertarian Christian Institute, took my and my podcast is now under their banner, under the Christians for Liberty Network. And yeah, I like to just talk about what the Bible, what I say in my intro is, you know, the podcast is about exploring what the Bible teaches about government, authority, and human relationships. And you know, a lot of people, when we talk about politics and the Bible, they'll bring up render unto Caesar. And I go, yeah, but what comes after that? And I know we're going to talk about this later, mm-hmm. but we, it's render unto God. It's like, well, what does that mean? And that That's kind of what I like to dive into is, you know, let's let's read what the Bible has to say about these subjects as a whole and not necessarily just uh, run with the conventional interpretations that I think have gone astray. Okay, great. Um, let me... So, folks, I ran this by Jacob ahead of time, and so it's I'm going to be pushing back on some of the things he says in this episode, not because I disagree with him per se, but just I think that helps him get across his worldview better to you know have it go through a wind tunnel, as it were. So, Jacob, I know there are so for one thing, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. I mean, he covers a lot of territory in that book, but I think where what the point of the mirror is is to say i am not you know i don't like this trend as of when he wrote that of you know talking about like someone is a pacifist christian or i'm a i forget the various things that were popular at the time but people who were using christianity as a springboard to whatever their political activism was and and it was often people on the left where at least from our point of view we would say oh yeah leftists and and you get that you know so you could see that um and so it's more they cared about the Bible in the or the Gospels in particular because, oh, I really feel more people should contribute to feeding the homeless. And so, uh, oh, if it's a Christian nation, then I'll appeal to that or whatever. You know, so it's and as opposed to having Jesus be the Lord of your life kind of thing. And so and I've heard similar concerns from people who agree with you and me on many issues politically to say, you know, no, you, you guys are like sort of putting Rothbard first and Jesus second, because, Hey, look at, I can point to a lot of be- uh, gospel passages that back up my, whatever, anarcho capitalism or whatever it is, as opposed to the other way around. So what do you say to people who are concerned about, or just in general, the theology is so much more important than these base concerns of politics and economics mm. that, you, you know, so you, yeah. you get the idea. So how, how do yeah. you feel about that kind of thing? No, that's a good it's a good question, and that does come up a lot. So I think the way I answer that is is sort of by saying that every in the same way that we as who understand you know uh, markets and, and Austrian theory, we, we we sometimes label in the Misesian sense that everything is economics. Mm-hmm. I think almost that also applies to to politics in a sense that everything is political, and the Bible deals with things like, uh, again, human relationships, rules, morality, and authority. And to, to say that that applies to all areas of human life, but then that politics is a weird special sphere where our faith and the teachings of the Bible have, you know, have no involvement, uh, I would say is a mistake. Now, I would be clear here, I, I think that there is wisdom in trying to, you know, be gracious with fellow believers on the issue of politics and what I what I'm careful to do in, in my podcast and when I'm like on social media or whatever I, I don't want to tell someone you know you're not a real Christian if you're not X right, right like right, I, yeah. I think that's not only not not only do I think that that's not true because I think ultimately like you can be saved and just be wrong about politics but it's also just insulting and not helpful towards convincing someone to listen to your ideas anyway mm-hmm. so uh, I would I would not say that you know there is a correct political philosophy taught in the Bible that is libertarianism and if you're not a libertarian then you're a, a bad Christian uh, but I think that as we mature in the faith and if we and if we decide that we're going to have again have our, our faith have what the Bible teaches impact our worldview on all things then I think that you know we we can make, you know, better or worse conclusions about what a Christian view of, of government and politics is. And so, and, and I try to be careful with how I phrase it. It's not that I'm going into the Bible and trying to, you know, 
cherry pick a bunch of different verses to affirm my anarcho-capitalism or libertarianism. I think what rather the way I try to describe it is I think we if we just read the Bible and we, we read what it teaches about government and, and human relationships, authority and things like that, we're going to come away with conclusions that line up with the same conclusions that libertarians and uh, the, the Austrians and anarcho-capitalists have discovered through just kind of like advancing moral philosophy and, and, and natural law, which to me makes sense, right? Like if, if people are focusing on the natural law side of things, that general revelation should line up with what the Bible teaches, which is special revelation. They, they wouldn't be in conflict with one another. So th that's the way I would try to describe it. And in terms of like, well, you know, is I think some people also to what you were asking would say, well, well, is it is it helpful or necessary as a Christian to do so? And, you know, I think that a, a again, I, I don't want to mix this with salvation, but a necessary component of the gospel message and of of Christ's ministry and his identity is that, you know, he is Lord. He is he is the one true king and his kingdom is the one true kingdom. And so I think that there are things in Jesus's life and ministry and teachings and in the rest of the biblical corpus that do call us as Christians to take specific stances and understandings of these human kingdoms and of earthly rulers. And again, I think that those things line up with libertarian anarchism. Okay, good. Yeah, a lot of stuff there. Let me... Um, it, it's weird. I can never uh, put my finger on exactly, because on the one hand, I definitely can appreciate how if I am at church on a Sunday and it's close to a election day, I don't want the pastor to get up. I certainly don't want him telling us who to vote for. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think I want him telling us who he's voting for. Um, and yet on the other hand, like you say, I mean, if it's the kind of thing where clearly we all agree, it's not just that, Oh yeah. Church, holy stuff is on Sunday. And then you go back to worldly living the other six days of the week because that's practical. And you know, Oh, you, you can't get, have people take advantage of you and you can't be a sucker. And you know, and you know what I mean? Like clearly that's not correct either. And so it's, I'm having trouble reconciling the two. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, you see the apparent tension. Can you mm -hmm. help me get through that? Like what, what is the, is there some principle that actually handles both of those situations? That's. Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately I like the way, I mean, I'll use my pastor as an example. Mm -hmm. I like the way he's always handled uh, elections. And the, I think the last time we had an election cycle, um, the Sunday before that happened, he said, listen, whatever you do at the polls, if you're casting a vote and you're putting your faith in a politician, if you're putting your faith in government to solve problems, then, you know, you're, you're missing the point of what we're doing here every Sunday. You know, our, you know, no, no human institution, no political figure, no, no political party is going to be your savior. We have one savior and, and we have one gospel. And so, um, that's, I think, what the ultimate message should be. Now, you know, going beyond that, let's say people are just voting on, you know, not like they're putting their faith in it, but they just mm -hmm. have their, their preferences and, and they're trying to, you know, they think they're fulfilling some sort of civic duty or whatnot. And should a pastor, you know, or people at church have anything to say about that? Um, again, I think, you know, should, should you get up there and say you need to go vote for the Republican or the Democrat or the Libertarian candidate or something? I don't know if you should make endorsements of, of people, but I think you can definitely just speak to the issues and try to speak truth to them. Right. Um, you know what I mean? And I, whether that's on international affairs and like, you know, we, my pastor I know is him and I were talking about this current conflict between Israel and, and Gaza and the Palestinians. I know he's, you know, going to be saying something to the, he, he told me this much. He's like, I know I'm going to get up there and upset any of the dis dispensationalists in our congregation. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, so we need to speak the truth first and foremost mm -hmm. on any of these issues, you know, whether it comes to, uh, you know, the, who, who is the true Israel, you know, what are, what are our opinions on, uh, you know, I, I think the government, uh, sorry, the Bible does teach us things about, uh, taxes, teaches us things about property rights and stuff. So, I mean, um, you know, I think the Bible makes it very clear in things like 
you know, do not steal, do not covet. Uh, there's the, uh, the the parable of the workers in the vineyard. That's, uh, I think, Matthew 20 or 22, if I'm remembering correctly, where it says that the uh, the property owner can do with his property that which he, he wishes. So, I mean, it's like, I think the Bible makes a clear stance on property rights. So you can, from the poppet, say, listen, I mean, uh, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I am going to say that, you know, if if you're voting for someone or something that involves the mass extortion of people's property, that's in conflict with biblical teaching. You know, mm. that, that's that's what I would say, um, you know, focus on the issues more more so than the than the than the parties. But you can definitely, I think, speak to the the whole political system and the political apparatus by saying, you know, the, the first thing I said, which is uh don't put your faith and your hope in in any of these figures. Mm -hmm. And also, too, I mean, I, I can come up with exaggerated examples. Like, obviously, if they were considering a government measure that would outlaw Christianity or that would sure. make everyone yeah. have to worship a golden calf, I would expect every pastor to get up and tell his congregation that, no, that's not correct, and right. you need to oppose that, and we're not doing that. Um, yeah, even something like the, the American flag, a lot of— you know, churches will like on the 4th of July, they'll have their American flags out, they'll sing the national anthem. Like my, and again, like my church isn't run by anarcho-capitalists, mm -hmm. but I think, you know, they do make just clear biblical stances about like, so we're not going to have American flags up here. We're not going to do the Pledge of Allegiance or the national anthem or do any of these things because mm -hmm. it's not like, you know, what, what you do is your business, but what we're going to teach and what we're going to practice as a corporate body um, you know, we don't think those things are appropriate. And you can do, you know, you don't have to be inflammatory, you right, know what I mean, right. when you talk about these things. Um, you know, we should humbly just proclaim the truth as we see it uh, revealed in, in the Scripture. Um, and but, but also have grace for people who disagree with us. I think that too often, I think, in this social media age we live in, it's like we, we just, like, you either don't say anything for risk of offending someone or— you go the opposite way. And no, I think people who are in positions of authority at church have a, they have a responsibility to speak the truth and to shepherd people. And sometimes that means saying uncomfortable things um, that might upset people, but you should, you know, try to do so in a way that's, that's loving and compassionate and, uh, you know, trying to, to reach them, not, not trying to uh, berate them or, or scold them necessarily. Okay. Yeah. Great. I, I, like I say, I I think I agree with everything you you said there, and that helps to winnow down exactly what is it that I think they, they should be doing up there. Because um, I do want to, again understand both of those impulses of oh yeah, I don't want you know you're debasing the you know the church church should be about godly things and not whereas no if the government's going to be going doing immoral things in your name, that's where, where else would your morals you know yeah I mean I mean that to speaks say. to the you know, I think that speaks to to one of my f foundational arguments for why I think you know anarcho capitalism is a the equivalent of what we would get from biblical morality. It's like I I, I don't think you know, and we're going to get into Romans thirteen, render unto Caesar, and all that. And it's like even in those passages, I don't see where it says, and therefore people in government are exempt from the Ten Commandments or exempt right, right. from it's like like the you know biblical morality is 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 universal it applies to everybody and so if it applies to everybody it has to apply to people in government and so the church I think has a you know now I'm gonna be careful like I don't think the church should be the government I don't mm -hmm. think the church should uh, run the government but the church definitely needs to have a role in the culture and also in speaking about what the government is doing because that's mm -hmm. a major part of society Okay, yeah, why don't we jump into uh, the famous render under Caesar. So I'll just read read this to refresh everybody's memory, or for some of you, maybe the first time. So this is, I'm reading the New King James Version. This is Matthew 22, coming in at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, 
whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So let me, one popular reaction to that is some uh, like standard Christian, at least Americans will say, right. So this is given the clear delineation and, you know, things of morals and what you do in your personal life, you know, how to be a better spouse or father or mother, da, da, da. That's what Jesus is saying. That's God's stuff. But, you know, paying taxes and going and doing your civic duty. And if you got drafted, yeah, you'd have to go to war. And do it. like, that's, you know, they're making a distinction between the areas in your life where the state has authority and the areas in your life where God has authority. That's all that's saying. It's pretty open and shut. And I'm guessing you wouldn't agree with right the way I, what I just said. So could take yep. it away. So um, there's a lot of different ways that we can look at this passage. Uh, I'll plug a really good article on the Mises Institute website. Uh, it's uh, by Jeff Barr. It's called Render Unto Caesar, a Most Understood New Testament Passage. I mm -hmm. uh, highly recommend anyone read that because I think he does a really good job at explaining the historical context here. What's really relevant for the way I like to tackle it is is mainly the point that, and it says it right in the biblical text, that the Pharisees were seeking to entrap Jesus. So you have to ask yourself, well, what's the trap here? Like, what, what, what are they hoping Jesus is going to say that's going to result in the outcome that, you know, that, that would be beneficial for them? And they're trying to discredit Jesus or get him in trouble. So there's a divide among the, the Jewish people and leaders at this time on the legitimacy of paying the tribute to the Romans. And a lot of, a lot of the Jewish people... Uh, didn't think that it was legitimate, you know, viewed the the Roman emperor as basically like an idol, claiming to be like like divine, which is, you know, obviously an affront to Jewish and also Christian ideas of idolatry and, and there being only one God. And the, so if Jesus were to respond to them and say, well, yes, you should pay your taxes, He's going to discredit himself to a lot of his followers and a lot of the Jewish people who encounter him, and they can use that against him. But if he says, well, no, you, you, you shouldn't because the Romans aren't the legitimate ruler or you know, they're claiming to be God and divine and that's wrong, well, then they can get him in trouble with the Roman authorities. And that's the trap. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' answer can't be you know, really either of those because— the passage ends with the Pharisees walked away astounded by his answer. So clearly his answer is like a complete flipping of the chessboard in terms of the trap that they thought that he had set for him. So I think what he basically said was, was I would describe it this way. He is just describing the norms of what we owe people and what we owe God and mm -hmm. saying, this is the truth. And so when he says, render unto Caesar, okay, what render under Caesar's that begs the question, what is Caesar's? What belongs to Caesar? And that begs the follow up question of, well, how do we define what is normative in terms of what people are owed and what are legitimate claims to property? And I think you would struggle to anywhere in the Bible find uh, a passage that says that that would support the idea that what is normative in terms of claims, legitimate claims to property is, well, holding someone at gunpoint or theoretical gunpoint, extorting them and saying, you owe me, you know, 20% of your harvest or 20% of your income. And if you don't give it to me, you'll be thrown in a cage and violence will be used against you. Like that is not what the Bible would would say is normative in terms of claims of property. No, it would it would uphold like I kind of mentioned earlier, property rights. I mean the and again, do not steal. We we could just focus on that passage. I think there are many more that speak to property rights, but like, do not steal. I mean, you could just kind of use argumentation ethics right there and say like, well, do not steal basically implies that people can have legitimate claims to property, and if there are property rights and legitimate claims to property. And you take someone else's property, that's that's wrong. You can't have stealing without property rights, and property rights are, you know, based on either you 
created the property yourself through, you know, natural appropriation or creation of something new or voluntary trade. And then the second part is equally important because he says, follows up, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's with render unto God what is God's. Okay, well, what belongs to God? What is, what is Jesus trying to get at here? And I think what Jesus is getting at here is what God is owed is everything, right? And beyond just everything, God has owed your allegiance and your worship. And this puts a follower of God in conflict with the Romans and their claims to authority and their claims to divinity. Like, how can you, how can you do uh, business with the Romans? How can you pay tribute to them? How can you uh, view them as legitimate rulers while also claiming to worship the one true God? You know, this goes to later when Jesus says that you can only serve two masters, right? So if, if we're giving to God everything that he is owed, I would argue that there's really nothing left to give to Caesar other than, you know, I mean, I guess the, the, the exception here would be like, you know, if you partake in a government service, I, I guess you owe, you know, payment for that service. Like if you use a toll road, pay the toll. Yeah. If you use a court, pay the court fee or something like that. So I'm not saying like, you know, this is a passage that says you should be freeloaders. And I, I think that there is, we'll get more into this when we get to Romans 13. I think that there is a, a biblical norm of civil governance, right? And so if, if people perform a service and you voluntary, voluntarily agree and contract with them to use their services, well, then you owe them something. But that's, you know, that's free markets at play. And that's not what the the Roman tribute, that's not what uh, taxation ultimately is. And we understand that as, as, as libertarians. And so I don't think this passage can be used to say, Jesus said, pay your taxes. Because if, if, if Jesus' answer can just be taken as, well, here Jesus says, pay your taxes, but also make sure you worship God. The Pharisees would have been happy with that answer. They would have been mm-hmm. like, ha, we got him. <laughs> now a bunch of the Jewish followers and stuff are going to be upset with him because right. they, 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 that's not the answer that they wanted to hear Jesus say. Well, what what's interesting is just on its own terms, it's a tautology. Like what he said, no one could possibly say that's wrong. Right. To say, render under Caesar what is Caesar's and under God what is God. Like nobody could object to that. And also it's a, I, when I had someone else on, we were going through this, I just reiterated my view that, it was a masterful thing because the whole part about him saying, show me the coin whose image is that there's a sense in which that's not really relevant to the answer he gave, but yet by him going through that, it kind of led them down a path. And so then when he drops the punchline on them, you can see why they, you know, they marveled at his words or were astonished at his teaching and say, cause it's like, Whoa, what you, you could see how they were just legitimately you're like, you're right that they thought we have him no matter what he says, or if he doesn't answer, you know what I mean? Like you could see him kind of hemming and hawing, knowing the trap and saying right. a bunch of nonsense. And he didn't. He, you know, went and said, show me the coin. It sounds like he's going to give a real definitive answer. And then he says something that it's not meaningless, but yet it's hard to like pin him down. Like, wait a minute. What do you mean by that? <laughs> right. So like such the thousands of years later, we're still talking about what did he mean by that? So it, it, you're not my joke is to say. Yeah, it's the kind of thing that this, you know, that God, if he became a man, that's what he would say in that situation. You know, right. like no, no human would have come up. Shakespeare wouldn't have come up with something that witty. No. Um, so th- there is that element. Um, and I, I guess, uh, well, I have seen people, I'm wondering your take, Jacob, about th- to say, oh, no, it wasn't merely a diversion with the saying, show me the coin, is that he maybe what he was getting at was telling the Jewish people, well, okay. If you are grumbling under the suppression and you don't want to be paying the tax, why are you using their money? Right. That, that's something I think mm-hmm. Jeff Barr brings up in his article, which and mm-hmm. there's a whole, you know, historical analysis of like the descriptions that are on the coins and who would have the coins. And you'd only have the coins if you were kind of, you know, doing business with the Romans. So, yeah, yeah, there's an element there, too, where Jesus, you know, very very plausibly was exposing them as hypocrites trying to uh entrap him for something that they're you know potentially guilty of themselves so yeah that that's definitely an element to it And like i said i think that article does a very good job at 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 adding adding a lot of historical detail and stuff that that goes into uh helping to explain this passage as well because there's yeah i mean i think the 
a lot of the Roman coins, when you look at them, they they depict Caesar in this very, you know, like godlike way. I mean, and Caesar mm-hmm. was often referred to as a son of God mm-hmm. and was was viewed as divine. So yeah, I mean it it wasn't just that the Romans were unjust like rulers and stuff. The, the Jewish people viewed the 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 uh the claim as idolatry and paying taxes to him was was kind of a act of participating in that in that idolatry so that that's very much and again and it's like what where when we ask render unto god what is god you know and that's commandment one and two worship uh you will worship me alone you know the one true god and you will not bow down to any idol you know god doesn't want 80 percent of our worship he doesn't want 90 percent of it he doesn't mm-hmm. want 99 percent of it he wants a hundred percent of our worship and our allegiance and loyalty. Okay. And that's a good springboard then to the next one. That of course is whenever we have libertarian Christians on or Christian libertarian, yeah, libertarian Christians, (laughs) uh, (laughs) we get into Romans 13. So let me go ahead and, uh, it's read. the roads of the uh, yeah, Christian exactly. libertarian. Uh, so, all right, this is okay. Romans 13. We'll start from verse 1. And again, this is New King James, people who are keeping score at home. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil, Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And just a couple more verses here. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake, for because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So I don't understand how you can be an anarcho-capitalist and claim to be a Bible-believing Christian, because that seems pretty open and shut. Right. I'm guessing yeah. you disagree with that. So what do you think? Right. So, yeah, the the common interpretation people take away from this is that uh, what Paul is describing here is that God, because of his providential decree, sovereignty over all things, that all authority structures and figures, governments, states, empires, whatnot, uh, they only come into power because God allows it. So God's instituting these human authorities. And so therefore, if we disobey them, we're disobeying God. Mm -hmm. Right there we have a problem because there's a lot of examples in the Bible of people disobeying governing authorities. So then the the way people try to explain this is go, well, if if there's a conflict where obeying the governing, governing authorities causes you to disobey God, then you have to disobey the governing authorities. And Can I, I mean, jump right. real fast, Jacob? Sure. Right, so that's specifically the way R.C. Sproul um, right. handles it. And I went back and reviewed the last time I had someone on to talk about Romans 13. I just listened to it. And yeah, exactly what you just said. He said, it's cl- it's very clear, you know, the Christian, in general, it's supposed to be like, Christians should not be objectionable to any, but like at work, everybody should be like, oh yeah, those guys right there that are Christians, like they're the best janitors we've ever had. They come in here, they're always in a good mood. They don't mind doing dirty work or whatever. They're just boom, great attitude and da da da. And if you're a civil servant, you know, they come in and they fill out that paperwork and they do, and they're at the DMV and they're, you know, and if you're a soldier and you're a Christian, yep, they go and they, they don't do war crimes, but you know, if they're legitimately defending the country and the wars are lawful, they carry them out with duty and sacrifice and and the Christian, and of course we pay taxes. But now if the government were to order us to worship Baal, well then no, as a Christian, you can't do that because that's in conflict with God's direct rule. So that's kind of R.C. Sproul's take that, yes, you just, you you do everything in the utmost to be like a, um, the salt and light and so forth. And that, uh, but yeah, obviously if there's a direct conflict, then you can't. And and to be clear, there's part of that interpretation that I would affirm. I mean, I think, you know, this is one of my favorite passages Mm -hmm. is Daniel three, Meshach, Radshach, and Abednego. They did not obey Mm -hmm. uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. They did submit to the punishment and they said, God will either deliver us or he won't. And so mm-hmm. 
Uh, although I am an ANCAP, and I, I will go on to explaining why I think Romans 13 doesn't actually defend the state, um, I'm not advocating for like being violent revolutionaries. I do think there is an aspect to being a Christian that does mean that we should be above reproach, and that even in the face of persecution, oppression, and living under an unjust uh, authority structure, you know, we see in many passages, heck, I mean, the passage preceding this one, Romans 12, and uh, I think First Peter chapter 2, we're told to do good to those who, who, per, who persecute us. Um, and so that that is an element uh, where people like R.C. Sproul, I think, are correct. But I think to go deeper into what I think people are missing here about Romans 13 is that if we read this as the justification is God's providence over governing authorities, why does that only apply to governing authorities? Like, are we are we to never resist anything that God is is sovereign over? Because I mean, if you if you have, and I'm more reformed, so maybe some Christians who are more open theists wouldn't have this problem. But if you believe God's sovereign over everything, well, then everything that happens is because of God. So can you just, are you not supposed to resist anything that happens to you? Just mm -hmm. be a doormat, roll over, and let it happen? Uh, I don't think that's mm -hmm. true. And then secondly, the way that the governing authorities are described here, I think, just raises a question of, okay, is this really talking about just universally every human kingdom or state? Because the, the key verse here, uh, I would say, is in verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the uh, one in authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. He is a minister of God, in verse 4, for your good. It's like, okay, does that really describe the Roman Empire? Does mm -hmm. that really describe, like, really any human uh, state, you know, our current state we live in, and, and, and many others who are even worse than the current state we live in? I, I don't. I, I think the problem here is that people are reading this, and we have this common conflation between the state and governance. And I think you know those who are well versed in libertarian theory know that you know having civil governance and the state be synonyms is is not true, not helpful. Uh, you know, as libertarians, even as ANCAPs, you know, th we're not against the idea of the administration of property rights. We believe in there, there, there's a role in society for civil governance, which I would define as the pursuit of civil justice. Uh, and that is what is being described here. But the state, and we understand this as, as ANCAPs, the state is, just by definition, by its very nature, not able to meet this description here. And I would actually argue that this description here is not just, it's not that Paul is just describing the state. Paul is sort of in a in his description prescribing to us, defining to us the norms of what godly or righteous civil governance looks like. So that that mm -hmm. prescription of what governments are supposed to do is just there. They're not a terror to good works, but to evil. And this would make sense in the context of 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 Romans. Paul is really good at like answering objections that people have. He, he's really good at anticipating what people are going to say and then answering it. Well, in Romans 12, it ends by him saying, do not seek personal vengeance. Do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. And I think people would read, you know, what Paul is saying at that point and go, all right, well, what do we do when people are like murdering or stealing or whatnot? And I think what, you know, Paul is kind of getting at here then in Romans 13 is saying, okay, I don't want you, if someone does wrong to you or your neighbor, to go out and take justice into your hands, necessarily. Now, that doesn't apply for self-defense. This is more like if, let's say you broke into my house and stole my TV. Like, okay, would it be wise or, uh, you know, commendable Christian behavior for me to respond to that by breaking into your house and stealing your TV <laughs> or, mm -hmm. or burning your house down or breaking your window. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. that's, that's not me pursuing justice. That's me seeking vengeance. So we're, we're to reject that, but then Paul is affirming, okay, there's a role for civil governance. We need to be subject to those who are administering civil justice, who are fulfilling this role of civil governance. And listen, if you're doing nothing wrong, you don't have anything to fear from just civil authorities. But if you do evil, beware. So I think 
to, to sum it up this way, I think Romans 13 is not a description of de facto of every state. It is rather a prescription of civil governance, of godly, of biblical civil governance. And the state can't measure up to that. The state, by its very nature, violates the principle of non-aggression. The state is supposed to protect violate. Uh, sorry, the state is supposed to protect property rights, but by its very nature, it violates property rights. The state violates consent. The state uh, initiates coercion and violence against against people on a regular basis. And even if we were going to ignore that, just the nature of the state, the evidence of most states that we see in history and today is that they don't actually live up to this description in Romans 13. They aren't a terror to evil and not a terror to those who do good. A lot of times that's flipped upside down. And the people who do good are the ones being persecuted. And the people who do evil, not only are they often sometimes exempt from it, I would argue that very often the nation state is run by just evil people, by by some of the worst people in society. I mean, even someone like C.S. Lewis you know, has said things like that, that the people who pursue power are, are the ones who are the least fit to <laughs> to do mm-hmm. so. I mean, that's a, that's a common observation that many Christians have made. So yeah, that, that's what I would, I would say that Romans 13 cannot really be reconciled with, with the state. Uh, I've heard other interpretations that, that try to do so. And I just, I, I, I think they fall short. I think this is a, pres- a prescription for the needful need for civil governance Because we don't want you taking personal vengeance. We don't want to live in a society where everyone's just trying to take justice into their own hands. But we do need people who are going to protect property rights, but they are not to be a terror to those who do evil, uh, not to be a terror to those who do good, and only to those who do evil. Yeah, um, good stuff there. I I am enlarged. I think I agree with everything you said. what one thing I can say for sure is the way a lot of right wing American Christians try to use that uh, to me makes no sense. So I, when I was at Hillsdale College as a professor, so this was between two thousand three and six. I don't remember what year this was, but um, and I was invited. I think it was Brad Berzer's class. He was you know he was a professor and he knew uh, they were covering anarchy and whatever class it wasn't so he had me come and give a little you know a lecture guest lecture on that stuff and i outlawed the, the different varieties including you know rothbardianism and um you know i covered left-wing stuff as well and then somehow it came up and i addressed this because there were a lot of small government republicans in the audience you know kids that were very serious christians and they thought romans 13 was an open and shut case like how could you possibly endorse anarchy of any kind and so I said to them, well, you're okay with George Bush invading Iraq, but a plain reading of Romans 13 says the only reason Saddam's in power is because God put him there. And what do you mean Saddam right. is an evil dictator? The only Iraqis who had to fear Saddam's chemical weapons were criminals. You know, right. if you had, if you didn't do anything wrong, Saddam's not going to hurt you, well, according you know, to you know right. the, the face value reading of that. So clearly, you, yeah. Right. You'd have to say that the Jews in the Holocaust somehow deserved what was happening to them because i mean you know he's hitler has been ordained by god right he, he's he's a minister of god for their good he's it's like that that just we we have to be careful uh and again i'm coming from a reformed perspective and you know reformed mm. theology generally is you know very high on god's sovereignty but we have to be careful to not confuse god's providential decree with his moral decree and yes so god is providentially sovereign over everything that happens. And we believe that he is at work in everything that happens, even evil things that happen, and he is working mm-hmm. them for good. I mean, that's what Joseph says in uh, you know, in, in the, the book of Genesis. And right. we see this all throughout the Bible, that terrible things happen, and God orchestrates those terrible events of what men meant for evil he uses for good. That doesn't make the evil not evil. <laughs> and, right. And, so, and, and, and even, too, just to be clear, like, if somebody did want to come up and say, you know, and I could imagine like a certain type of Christian pacifist arguing that, that no, in some grand sense, no, God is allowing. And I know, I remember I read Elie Wiesel, his account. I think I'm saying this right. That, that he was walking with like the elder and 
him and some of the younger guys when they were getting rounded up were going to try to rush the guards or something and that the elder Jewish people told them, no, if God wants us to be rescued, he will. And, and he was, was mad about that late later. Like we had a chance to escape early on. And so there is a, 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 a school of thought saying, per se, I'm not even saying that's wrong. What I'm saying though, is the, the kids at Hillsdale yeah. who thought they could use the plain text reading of Romans 13 to blow me up, say Rothbard can't be right. Cause look at this while, yeah, we're going to go have regime change in Iraq because Saddam's an evil dictator. That I was saying, no, that doesn't work with <laughs> that, yeah. that particular combination of views. Exactly. Um, the other thing too, I don't know if this, if you find this compelling Jacob, but again, not even, so, even somebody who's more middle of the road, not weirdo Rothbardianism, but a, a standard American Christian who likes the founding fathers really likes the U S constitution and got by gosh, if this country just got back to first principles and da, 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 this is, you know, this God has blessed this land and so forth. Okay. When Paul was writing these epistles, he was not thinking of a bicameral legislature and, you know, a federal system of, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, oh, and where women could vote, he would have been floored right. and said, well, you guys insane. You let women yeah. vote. So <laughs> I'm saying like, clearly Paul's political views were not anywhere near. So whatever he was thinking about it, it, So I guess that's, do you understand what I'm trying to get at that? I could argue and I have argued that, yeah, Paul is trying to describe a just social order with the rule of law. And I'm not against the rule of law. I'm not against right. law enforcement. Right. It's just the system. I think that achieves that outcome with the least amount of injustice and blah, blah, blah is, you know, what would be called Rothbardian anarcho capitalism, right? Just like people who are familiar with Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine and da, 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 and Madison would think, Oh, we understand how better to achieve a civil society than Paul did back then sitting in prison and writing epistles. And that, you know, there's no contradiction there. Like Paul yeah. was divinely inspired and the stuff he said is true, but he didn't know the proper way to implement a government on earth just because we've learned a lot oh, since yeah. then. A absolutely. I'd agree with that a hundred percent. Like, I don't think Paul was envisioning anarcho-capitalism when he wrote Romans mm -hmm. 13, which sometimes people will try to accuse me of saying that. Like, no, I think he's just saying that government need to, you know, like the civil governance is about enforcing biblical morality. And I think the best way to enforce biblical morality in the civil sphere is libertarian anarchism, Rothbardian anar anarchism. I think that, and that everything else, not only does it not work as well, but it's going to fly in conflict with that description there in Romans 13. So it, and, and then, you know, the, the latter part of Romans 13, I think is actually echoing the render unto Caesar passage. Cause Paul then goes on uh, in verse six to say, uh, you pay taxes to to God's ministers, render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So right there, that's kind of echoing Jesus's language of like, render unto Caesar what Caesar's. Mm -hmm. So it's like, listen, if you go on a toll road, pay the toll. Like, don't be, uh, don't be a freeloader. Don't be this like rabble rouser who's trying to stir up trouble. Uh, so if you if you use a service or a product pay that. And, that and he's like that's not just taxes that's just you know even even honor and respect and customs you know we need to you know give people to what what they're owed but then you know people who bring up romans 13 don't often like to read past verse verse 7 we go on to verse 8 right after he says give you know to people that which they're owed he goes owe no one anything except to love one another <laughs> so mm -hmm. there that's a that's an important element of it too and you could read that as saying you know yes pay people what they're owed but you know you should probably try to live your life where you don't really owe people anything <laughs> yeah 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 um to circle back to something you said um i forget the exact wording you used but the idea of when, when i was saying what rc Sproul's interpretation was and i was going through all this stuff like you should be the best janitor they've ever seen and you should be you know and all this stuff and the best civil servant and the best you know corporal in the marines and that 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 whatever your role is, there's a way to do that. And, um, w you know, which somebody could, could be, uh, in our view, like a, a statist or something and still believe that stuff. And you were saying how you had some sympathy for that and that, yeah, there are certain things where even if you don't necessarily endorse the overall system, as long as you're not directly violating a, a you know, a godly command, then it's okay to go. And I think that the epitome of that is in, um, Matthew 17, 
He's reading from verse 24 here about paying a temple tax. So just for people who don't know this one, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? And Simon and Peter are the same guy, folks. From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you've opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. And so I think that's an example where right. Jesus is saying, I don't owe them this temple tax, but just so we don't make waves and like, you know, we're, there's going to be a lot of controversy coming up from my ministry. We don't need to fight this particular battle. You kind of ran your mouth off, Peter, and didn't say the right thing, or you should have checked with me or something. But okay, since you said that here, but even there, it wasn't like, let's go engage in commerce and raise a coin. It was like a miraculous go in the right. thing and pull it out of the fish's mouth. <laughs> So how, right. how do you respond to that? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, that sentiment that I think, uh, as, as and it can be tough, you know, as, as Christians to try to strike that right balance. And I mm -hmm. think that's where God's grace comes in. We, we, we're not always going to hit, you know, perfectly hit the mark in terms of how to respond to these things, but you can call out something as being unjust or, uh, misaligned, inefficient, not doing what its biblical role is. But it, it, if you're not being asked to participate in sin, um, you know, even that, I'm a little, I can hear people objecting to that saying, but your tax money is used to fund war and abortion. But I don't have any evidence that if I didn't pay my taxes, they would stop uh, killing babies and stop doing mm -hmm. war. You know, as long as the Federal Reserve exists, that's, uh, <laughs> they're going to print the money to right. do that anyway. So yeah, you, you have to kind of weigh these things out. And it's like, I, you know, if I don't, if I don't pay my taxes, uh, even though I would say the government isn't owed my taxes, I'm going to be a better servant of God and his kingdom if I pay those taxes so that I can be in the position to take care of my family, continue to earn revenue that I can give to my church, give to other ministries to, mm. that I think are doing God's work, and to do what I do, which is <clears throat> to advocate for the illegitimacy of the taxation system, which is easier to do from where I'm at in the basement of my house where I pay taxes for, uh, as opposed to being in jail <laughs> for not paying right, the taxes. Right. So yeah, I think, you know, it's a little bit of wisdom and also, um, and, and also it's about like, we're going to potentially discredit ourselves to people if we are, uh, you know, like these are illegitimate rulers, so we're not going to listen to anything they say. Again, everything they might tell you to do might be illegitimate, but if you're able to, you know, turn the other cheek, so to speak, or walk that extra mile and do it. Um, I think that actually creates the opportunities by which we can be used by God to accomplish great goods. And that's, I think, mm -hmm. you know, that that goes more into the teaching of how we respond to persecution. Again, like in Romans 12 and First Peter chapter 2, what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. You know, I, I think that there's um, a lot of wisdom in responding to evil with uh, not just like bearing it, but like responding in that 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 very loving way. Like uh, it, it disarms people and it opens up the door to to something that I think is even more important. Like all this is important, but but even more important than that is is preaching the gospel uh, to people and being that ambassador for Christ and His kingdom. And so, yeah, I mean that, that those things are a little bit a little bit in tension, but I think that that reconciliation can be made. You can say the government isn't owed my taxes; I'm going to pay them anyway. Uh, and heck, like you know, if 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 a police officer pulls you over or stops you somewhere, and you think it's completely illegitimate, and odds are you're probably right, and you don't support the police system. And instead of like being disgruntled, respond to that officer with with not just cooperation, but like appreciation and love, mm -hmm. and just show them the love of Christ. There, um, you don't know what kind of good that's going to do. Um, and and you know we can continue to advocate for better systems of justice, uh, not necessarily take it out on that individual police officer that is pulling us over for going four miles over the speed limit or having a broken taillight or something. Yeah, if if I ever get you know, in the gulag 
for my political views and stuff. I, I would like to be the guy that like, I'm constantly working on the prison guard or something like trying to convert right. him. It's like, like you can quit this job. You're like, Frank, come on. You're a good man. I've seen the way you, you know, you broke up that fight the other day in the shower and that and you don't need yeah. to do this job. You can, you can find better. We don't need to be doing this. You don't be working for these people, you know, and that kind of, and I'm not just doing it to mess with them. Like I'm right. trying like to make the best of a situation and not be mad at him. Like I get it. You got to feed your kids. You know, you, just ended up in this job and now you got your benefits and you can't quit because oh man i don't know how i'm gonna take care of my family you know so yeah i mean I'll go, i would like I'll to go be one, that guy yeah yeah no i i, I would like to too uh, and i'll go even one further I, I i mean the bible says pray for your leaders i mean i pray for joe biden every day that mean it doesn't mean i support it doesn't seem does. like it's working yeah it, it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I, you know, we should pray for our governing leaders. Uh, not just, not, not even just those in Washington. Pray for your mayors. Pray for your sheriffs. Mm -hmm. um, pray for 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 the people who are in uh, the, the grunt workers in in government that um, in those positions of power that uh, you know that a maybe they'll reconsider what they're doing, uh, or, or at the very least that the power that they have, even if it's illegitimate, that they're going to use it for good. Um, I mean, listen, I, I don't support our current governing system, but I'm, you know, still kind of praying that uh, we're not going to send financial aid over to Israel, that we're not going to escalate this conflict into a big global war. You know what I mean? And uh, and, and ultimately praying for these people to uh, have an encounter with Christ so that they can uh, <laughs> re repent and turn from their ways. And that's, you know, that's kind of what our prayer should be for our countries, even kind of like what God, uh, I think it was. Uh, I think it was Samuel. I forget which prophet. It was like the, if you repent and turn from your ways, God will be faithful and heal your, your nation and stuff. It's like, that's mm -hmm. what our prayer should be. And none of that's in conflict with saying, I think this is all illegitimate and against what the Bible teaches about government right, right. And, and all that. We, we don't have to be uh, the, you know, the the libertarian meme, like the boogaloo guy ready to <laughs> right, right. go out there and cause, cause a conflict. Okay, well... If we can just spend like this, as we wrap up here, we've got about five minutes left, I think, um, for the time I said I would have you for. Can you, you kind of, I was toying with whether to bring it up and then you just brought it up yourself. So I think it's fine. Right now, as we record this, obviously the big thing that is very pertinent to a lot of Christians is the situation in the Middle East. I know one strain of American evangelical thought is to say, we stand with Israel. That's God's chosen people. Obviously, they're misguided. They haven't seen that, you know, the person they're waiting for already came and that sort of stuff. But it, hey, that's kind of how they are in the Bible. And but they're they're a special people, and that's why they've been the target over the years of, you know, people's outbursts and stuff. It's because and this is where the end of the world is going to take place. So, so anyway, it's uh, America stands with Israel and come on. Yeah. Maybe this the soldiers may have done things in Gaza. They should, but in the grand scheme, come on, look at this. One group is trying to have a civilized society. This other group worships death and destruction. Give me a break. This isn't even, this is a no brainer. What, what do you say to something like that? Yeah. It, that That's uh, uh, trying to figure out how to, answer that in five minutes or less. Oh, so, it, it can go longer. I'm, I, yeah. I was priming the audience as the audience would know, but I guess they can see the timer. Right. So, yeah, I think that there's a, there's like a couple of different levels there. Mm -hmm. I mean, on a theological level, uh, I don't think that the current nation state of Israel has any connection to old Testament Israel. And can you elaborate? I think, and I, yeah, I yeah, said I think, that knowing again, just for people, like when I say these, someone might say, a lot of yeah, times yeah. I know what the response are, but I want to let set you up. So yeah, sure. that's one so, thing if you can explain what are you talking yeah. about? Is there, you know, Jews are God's chosen people. The Bible says so. No, yeah. I mean, I think the the New Testament is very clear about, you know, there's been a uh a fulfillment of the Old Testament covenant. Um so some people like to so I would I would ascribe not to dispensationalism, but to what I call covenantal um can you define what those terms theology? are yeah i mean dispensationalism uh which is a a i forget what it's schofield i think is the one who uh who was kind of like the founder of that uh i forget the exact year but it, you know basically a belief that 
uh, there are promises to Israel and about Israel in, in the Bible that have yet to come to pass and that, you know, Israel is part of some grand, you know, eschatological, you know, uh, epic that's going to play out at some point in in the in the future of the end of days kind of like what you described there and uh it's it and and i would you know ascribe more to a, a covenantal theology or uh, fulfillment theology although people pejoratively call this replacement theology but yeah i i think that the promises of that were made to abraham the promises that were made to the nation of israel are are now that the inheritors of this promise are the basic what I would what I would describe as the elect, all who are born again in Christ, got Christ's chosen people. So like the church, the body of Christ, we are the new spiritual uh, Israel, and we are the the inheritors of Abraham's promise. And this was always the plan because I think this is clearly spelled out in 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 multiple uh, multiple times in in the Old Testament covenant. It pointed to the future that there would be a new covenant when the law is no longer uh you know just written down by our hands but is written onto our hearts um and, and there, there's so much you know messianic prophecy that that plays into this as well so i think that 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 is why i don't think there's any connection to i mean not only i mean on a theological level i think there's no connection i don't think there's any promise to them now that's not to say it's not replacement theology like the jews are cast out forever mm -hmm. i mean paul makes it clear that jews can be grafted in uh, i think this is in, this is like romans 9 through 11 i think i'm, I'm kind of pulling from here in my memory where you know paul is sort of answering you know the objections to god um changing the, the you know the, the god's changing his promises and mm -hmm. and abandoning the jewish people and it's like but but makes it clear and he uses his Old Testament passages to justify this in, in describing, you know, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Not It's always been the case that not all who were from Israel, who were descendants of that line, were of the true Israel, even in the Old Covenant. And mm -hmm. God has always been sovereign over who, who the elect and who the chosen are. And so this is not a, it's not a replacement theology. It's God, God did fulfill the promises of the nation of Israel, he used the nation the, the nation of Israel to uh, set the stage to create the circumstances for the salvation of the world, and that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And now we're living under that that new covenant that's been expanded. And so the those who are inheritors, and, and this is this is laid out in Romans, it's laid out in Galatians three and four, I think as well, that the inheritors of Abraham's promise are not like you don't inherit that promise just because of who your daddy was or who your lineage is or what tribe you're from or what your ethnicity mm -hmm. is. You inherit that through faith by grace. That is what makes you part of Israel or part of part of God's chosen. And so I don't think that the nation of Israel, the modern day nation of Israel has any religious claim. And if you, you know, if you track the history of it, like it's not like there's a direct you know, I mean, it, it would take a, it would take far too long to kind of track the history of the, you know, from 30, you know, I, I guess when did, from when the second temple fell, which was what, like 67 or something like that to, to now, it's not like there's a direct line of causation where like the Jewish people remained one singular Jewish people and, and then reclaimed their nation. That's, in fact, the the founders of the nation state of Israel were, in, in many cases, not even religious Jews. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were just secular Jews who didn't, you know, who just wanted to have a ethnic homeland. It's like, and I mean, listen, I mean, I don't, I don't care if people voluntarily want to, you know, have freedom of association and they have in-group preference. That's fine if it's done peacefully, but there's no biblical you know, decree that says ethnicity uh, matters in this anymore. In fact, it, uh, I, th I forget which, I think it's in Galatians where Paul, Paul goes the opposite direction and says, no, like there is no male, no female, no Jew, no Greek, no free, no slave. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think that all of that just dispels this idea that Israel has some special theological uh role to play in in god's uh future plans and in the second coming and, and all that and you know just as we stated earlier i think 
you know, it's fine for there to be a nation state or a group of people who were under one governance and they want to call themselves Israel. Like, that's fine. And they even have a right to self-defense, but they don't have a right to initiate violence against peaceful people. Now, Hamas, they're not peaceful people, but mm -hmm. the uh, 50 percent of the Palestinian population that are children under 18 and a bunch of other civilians who are not part of Hamas, they haven't committed any violence. And if you want to justify that by saying they voted for Hamas, it's like, oh, boy, well, you just you just justified bin Laden's um, reasons for orchestrating 9-11 because we voted mm -hmm. in Bill Clinton, who authorized the sanctions on Iraq that killed 500,000 Iraqi children and and so many other, you know, atrocities that elected officials in America have contributed to. So, you know. If you want to play that game, we can do that, but you're not going <laughs> to, it, it, it's it's going to end up real bloody for you. So no, I, I don't think they have any theological importance. And, and then on a strictly political level, um, I mean, I'm fine with them going after the Hamas terrorists. What I'm not fine with is them using some special claim to that land to justify, uh, you know, basically keeping a group of people hostage in this weird state where they're not, they're not their own sovereign nation, but they're also not part of the Israeli nation where they have the full rights of Israeli people. And they're not, they're not just free to come and go as they please. This is, this is not a situation that I think you can, you can, you know, justify the actions of, of Israel based on any biblical principle. Yeah, it's, there's a lot there and obviously we could keep going for a long time on this in this topic but but you're right it's it's a weird like i've seen people say things like uh you know oh i'm sorry that uh, it's inconveniencing you that we stopped giving you all your electricity and food and is <laughs> and then like, told you you have 24 million... hours to evacuate I love right, that. hey we're gonna turn off your water turn off your electricity by the way a lot of these people's smartphones are probably dead now and then it's like oh and now you have 24 hours to leave before we invade northern gaza it's like how are you going to evacuate two million people from that small area that you've just already dropped bombs on and stuff, and their right. power is out? It's like that. Uh, yeah, it's just crazy. But but also like the like I don't think it was a free market outcome that some officials in Israel can just snap their fingers and now all no. of Gaza has no electricity. Like right. that doesn't sound like that's a <laughs> right. So um, okay, well I don't think we're going to solve that problem right now. So why don't we? end there. So my guest this week's folks, Jacob uh, Winograd and Jacob, thank you for your time. Can you point people, you did allude to some of your outlets in the beginning, but just for people who want to follow you, where can they go? Yeah, of course. And, and thank you again, Bob, for having me on. It's been real fun. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, like Bob said, I'm very active on there. It's uh, at Biblical Anarchy. If you want to find out more about the podcast, you could first go to biblicalanarchypodcast.com or libertarianchristians.com and look for Biblical Anarchy there. And then the podcast is uh, The Biblical Anarchy Podcast, and it's on pretty much everything, Spotify, YouTube, uh, Apple Podcasts, pretty much anywhere you can find podcasts, I'm probably there. Um, and yeah, I got I got you know, episodes that do deeper dives on the topics that we talked about today, uh, interviews there and stuff as well. Uh, so if... if, if that's something of interest to you, uh, go ahead and check that out. I'll also plug that recently LCI uh, was at Freedom Fest back in July, and we did like a whole, like two, including at Freedom Fest, we kind of focused for like two to three months on Christian nationalism. So if that's something you're interested in, go ahead and check that out. And also I'll plug the rest of my um, uh, f uh, Christians for Liberty uh, podcast hosts, uh, you know, check out the Libertarian Christian podcast, check out the Reformed Libertarians podcast, uh, which is done by uh, Greg and Kerry Baldwin. And, uh, and then we have uh, Norman Horn and his podcast, the Faith Seeking Freedom podcast. And we just launched a new podcast that I can't remember the name of, unfortunately, but it's a really cool one where uh, Norman sits down and interviews different entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and uh, basically talks to them about like their their like experiences where like their faith came into like a major like brought them to a major point of contention in some kind of like, you know, you know something in the corporate world or business world right. and how they handle that and stuff. And so it's a lot of cool stories like that, which I think people in your audience who are, you know, free market people would, uh, would be definitely interested in. So that's all I got. Uh, like I said, thanks again for having me on. It's been, it's been a lot of fun.
Okay, sure. And well, folks, if you go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 296, I'll ask Jacob to send me like some examples of good episodes that are on those things too, if you want to see a, a link there. All right. So thanks again, Jacob, for your time. And thank you ever for tuning in. We'll see you next time. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com. <laughs>